is I'm going to be leading I'm going to be leading our um, skill building session. And then after that, Christine will be discussing uh, our hot meals program or the hot meals program. Um, you may have seen that called the restaurant meals program and some of the handouts that we've given out as well. So just an FYI on that. And then um, Nichelle, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen, beautiful. Okay, so like I said, welcome to our virtual day of uh, our second virtual day of action. Um, today we're going to be discussing uh, uh, food security. Michelle, if you will move to the second slide. Um, so this is our agenda. We've already been over this, so we can skip this section. Uh, and like I said, today we're going to be discussing uh, uh, or rather talking about uh, researching a bill and its impact on you. Uh, although first, what I wanted to do is just mention uh, that, like I said at the beginning, I uh, am a responsible for the Affordable Housing Coalition with Empower Missouri. And we do have two meetings twice a month, uh, the second and fourth Monday of each month from two to three. And then out of legislative session, we have them once a month. Uh, the second Monday of each month from two to three. And our next uh, meeting is actually gonna be the this coming Monday uh, on the 11th at two o'clock. And you guys are welcome to join that. Uh, you can sign up on our website, um, empowermissouri.org. There's also a few different resources on that page regarding affordable housing as well. Okay. <clears throat> So what we're going to do today is discuss the, the very basics of law, how a bill becomes a law, and why it's important that you as the general public uh, are involved in that process. So there's several sources of law, and I don't want to get too involved in, in those sources, but you'll see on your screen, uh, uh, you know, the different sources of law for, for our discussion today, uh, the Congress, state and local government and the initiative petition process are, are ones that we're gonna be focusing on. Um, if you were at our day of action yesterday, the Capitol, there was some information that we gave out and did a presentation, which is very important as it's a voter initiated process. Uh, but like I said, Michelle, if you wanna move to the second or the next slide. Beautiful. Um, so the legislative process or the legislative uh, basics um, are important if you're gonna be doing any sort of advocacy at the Capitol, uh, especially if um, you're going to be talking to different lawmakers about the process and about your opinion in that process. So the United States Congress is made up of two different houses, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, in Missouri, we call our Congress the General Assembly, and that's broken up into the House of Representatives and the Senate, and they both work at the Capitol in Jefferson City. Um, the purpose of the legislative branch is to pass laws that govern um, how we all live in this country. Um, ideally, we want to do the best that we can to govern laws that make our lives better. Um, and really, the cool thing about the legislative process are, is that those laws are really what affect us on a local level, on a local and state level. So this, uh, this is a uh, simplified version of how a bill becomes a law. And I'm sure that some of you have remembered in school when they showed the after school special of how a bill becomes a law with the little song that goes along with it. I love that one. Um, so basically, for a bill to be enacted into law, it is introduced into uh, the House and the Senate. Now, it can the bill can be identical in both the House and the Senate. It then goes through first and second readings. Um, the one of the key places that you, as a member of the public, can get involved in this process is through public hearings. So this happens in committee, uh, and this is this is a really cool space that if if you are for or against a bill, either, either um, you can testify both in the House uh, and in the Senate. 
and you can you can submit your rest your written testimony either as an individual or as part of an organization or even part of a business that you have and you can do this like i said uh written um although doing so in person is best um and then after after the, any public hearings are are done it then goes to the committee executive session um which is then moved uh, to the perfection of the bill and its final passage. And then at that point, it goes to the other chamber and then that whole process starts over again. And then at that point, it's either signed by the governor or it's vetoed by the governor. And that's that's a very basic state level, uh, how a bill becomes a law, but really with public hearings, that's the best way to get involved with the process and really make your voice heard as a citizen. So, a lot of people don't don't realize that you can be involved in this process. Um, and like I said, the cool thing specifically about state and local law is that this is really, really what affects your day to day life, right? This affects your local taxes, even your school boards is are really going to or what's going to affect your your everyday life. Um, it also changes the current any sort of changes to current laws can impact uh you and i in new and different ways so following a bill um through the legislative process is a way to track to see how that's going to ultimately affect your life in a new way uh specifically for me i'm really interested in any sort of environmental bill so one of the cool things that you can do is track a topic you can track a specific topic that you may be interested in from affordable housing which is what we work on um, or even the environment. Um, that way you can track you know, how it's moving and if, it, if there's gonna be any sort of process that's going to affect you. Um, so there's several ways that you can research how a bill is, is going to ultimately impact you. Um, a quick Google search is gonna give you a lot of information um, and verifying a source uh, of the information that you're using is, is critically important. I often tell people to use .gov sites, um, .edu sites, as well as uh, .org sites. Um, I would say stay away from news sites. Uh, they're going to be uh, fairly opinion based. So if you can get something from an unbiased source, um, that's that's really going to be the best way to do that. So these are two of my favorite websites that I use uh, if I am going to be looking uh, at how a bill either affects affordable housing or one of the interests that I follow. Uh, GovTrack.us and FastDemocracy.com. I really like GovTrack.us because it's really easy to use. Um, you can track members of Congress. Um, you can track bills, uh, resolutions to those bills. Uh, and then Sarah uh, has linked both of those websites in our chat. And then um, the cool thing about govtrack.us is you can even look at uh, people's, or rather Congress people's uh, voting records, which is really neat. Um, and that's kind of cool because then you can follow, say, a local representative or a local senator from your hometown to see how they vote and really if they do have your best interest at heart as a citizen of that area that you're in. Uh, Fast Democracy is another one that I really like. This one, you can do bill trackers as well, and you can do this by topic. And then um, Nichelle is going to open up um, both of these sites, and I'm going to show you a little bit about the websites. Sorry, um, the link in the presentation wasn't letting me open it. Oh. <laughs> so um, I can, I'll pull up Fast Democracy and you can, you can okay. talk it through and I'll, I'll, it'll be up in a second. Sorry, everyone. All right, back to you, Amber. <laughs> awesome, thank you, I appreciate it. 
So when you log on initially to fastdemocracy.com, this is what you're going to see. Um, if you go down to the bottom of the page, I'm sorry, go a little bit, a little bit up, a little bit more. Are you logged onto the page, Michelle? I'm sorry. I do not have a fast democracy account. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Go back up and we'll do it a different way. All right. So at the top of the page, if you click on legislators and committees, mm -hmm. um, this is a way that you can look up your individual legislatures. Uh, it gives you a general overview. Um, and then if you scroll over to tracked topics, talking about and scroll down just to the middle of the screen there, these are all the different topics that you can follow on this website. So if you, Nichelle, just click on um, environment or immigration or what have you. Okay, so if you click on housing, what happens is it's gonna load all of the different um, um, bills that involve housing specifically. So what you'll see, for example, on the first one is, um, for this one, it's called the Pray Safe Act. So you'll see um, who sponsored it, who's involved in it. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll even see the last action that was done on this specific bill. And then even the latest version of what's uh, of that bill that's, that they're currently working on. And then if you scroll back up to the top of the page, um, and then next to track topics, that's where you can track the individual bills. So you can search right there. You can search for individual bills uh, in the search bar there. Um, yes, I very much agree, Victoria. Yes, yeah. And the cool thing, um, type in um, HB 1106 or SB 1106. And then you'll be able to, yep, perfect. On the left-hand side, you'll be able to select your state. In this case, it's going to be Missouri. So this is one that we're following currently. Um, and if you click on it, um, and then you scroll down slightly. So right in the middle of the screen here, you'll be able to see the official summary, any sort of comments like Victoria was talking about uh, right next to that, Michelle. Yep. Any comments that anybody's had. And the cool thing that I really like is you can see um, where, this has been talked about in the media. So which, uh, which news sources are talking about it? So that's kind of interesting as they all have a different, different thoughts and processes about that. So this is just a general overview of fast, fast democracy. And I really would recommend you just playing around this, with this website and getting familiar with it and seeing how it works. Because I really, I really do think this is a really good way for, for everybody to track particular bills and topics that they're interested in. Thank you, Michelle. And we can X out of this and can, we can go back to our, our slideshow. All right. And then you should be able to click on the next one. So um, that is all I have in regard to how Sorry, I think my, my computer muted me for some reason. Um, so that's, uh, that's a really good way that you guys can check out how a bill is going to affect you. Um, and if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to reach out. You can also do that in the chat. Um, or like I said, you can email me as well and I can walk you through that process. So uh, from, from then, Christine is going to be discussing our restaurant meals program or our hot meals program. Great, thanks Amber. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining today. As I said at the beginning, my name is Christine Woody and I am the Food Security Coalition Organizer for Empower Missouri. And today is our Food Security Advocacy Day. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, hunger and nutrition and food access um, in general. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about this bill, the Restaurant Meals Program 
uh, and talk about some advocacy we can do right now today, because this is actually very timely. Um, we have some news that this bill may be heard and possibly voted on today. So um, at the end, we have some great advocacy opportunities that you all can help me with um, right now. So Nashel, if you want to go to the next slide, so we do organize a food security coalition. It's made up of individuals and organizations from all across Missouri who are concerned about food access and food security and um, nutrition. And we meet on the second and fourth Fridays at 9 a.m. So our next call will actually be um, this Friday. So in just a couple of days, and I'm gonna stick in the chat the link to um, the Zoom that you can register for. So we do have people register for our calls um, just so I can have a list and email access um, to make sure I know everyone who's gonna be joining. So feel free to click on that and you can register for um, the call on um, this Friday, but also for all of the rest of our subsequent, subsequent calls that we will be having through the end of legislative session. And then after May, we'll probably reduce our calls to once a month. Um, just because there's not as much actively happening. So we hope all of you can join that. And Nichelle, if you wanna to go to the next one. <clears throat> so just a little bit about food, sec food security or food insecurity as the case may be in general. Um, there's over 13% of the individuals who live in Missouri who currently live in poverty. Um, that is based on the federal poverty level um, and that is calculated through census numbers and other um, poverty kind of related questions that happen through survey and census data. And as of January of 2020, so just a couple months ago, um, our SNAP program, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise used to be known as food stamps, uh, it, there were over 600,000 individual Missourians who were enrolled in that program. That is a lot of people who are helped by the SNAP program. As I said, SNAP means Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, that is the name that um, kind of was renamed from food stamps because they don't use like stamps anymore. Uh, so Congress, um, during one of the reauthorizations of that program, changed the name. So now it is SNAP. The way that the SNAP program works is that it is an income-based entitlement program. So if you qualify, if you fill out the application and you qualify based on your income and your assets and, and other kind of you know, questions about how much you spend on um, medical expenses and other sorts of asset questions, if you qualify, you will receive the benefit. Um, it is an entitlement program that is uh, legislated and um, funded on the federal level. So a lot of um, how the program is set up and how it's funded all happens in Washington, D.C. So we do a lot of advocacy on the SNAP program in general with our um, legislators uh, who are on the federal level. But the one thing about um, the SNAP program that is based here in, in, in Missouri is that it is administered on the state level. So our Department of Social Services administers the SNAP program for our state. Uh, it happens um, in Jefferson City with some kind of like satellite offices throughout the state. There's about one per county now. Um, since the beginning of COVID, a lot of them were closed. So it really was only an online or a phone call system to be able to access. Um, they have opened up some of those um, in-person sites where you can go and apply, but a lot of it does still happen through uh, online and over the phone. Um, the SNAP program is, has been proven to be one of the most successful anti-poverty programs in existence. It helps lift millions of individuals every month out of poverty with those benefits that they do receive. The way that it works now is that once you qualify, you receive like a debit type card. And on that debit card, you and your household receive a certain allotment every month. And you can use that debit card at grocery stores or convenience stores or other stores that serve cold, unprepared food that you will purchase, take home and prepare for your family, which is a wonderful program. It really does help millions of individuals um, every month to supply food for their families. Um, 
but I mean, there's some limitations to that. And that what brings us to the bill that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, if you want to move to the next slide, thanks, Nachelle. Um, this is back one. Um, this is the restaurant meals program. And the way that this program works, it is a federal option that states can apply for through USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture. And they're the program on the federal level that um, oversees the SNAP program. So states can um, apply for this option. And what this option allows is for specific individuals to be able to use the money that is on their EBT or their SNAP cards to purchase hot prepared food at certain grocery stores or certain restaurants. Um, it's really a limited program, right? It's for individuals who are elderly, who are disabled, or who are deemed homeless, which means they have a very difficult time preparing food, right? So someone who is a senior or disabled um, may have a difficult time navigating a kitchen and may have a difficult time working with a stove, may have a difficult time chopping up vegetables. Um, someone who's homeless does not have access to a refrigerator for food storage, does not have access to a stove to prepare these sorts of foods. So this program is not open to everyone that has SNAP. It really is a very limited a program to help a very specific population with the specific need of not being able to prepare their own food. And that's what Senator Angela Mosley is proposing with her Senate Bill 798. I'm going to put a link to the bill in the chat just so you can see um, what the bill actually says. And so just a little bit more about the program um, as we work through it. So uh, it was first created in 1978. So the program itself has actually been around for quite a while. Um, and there are some states that have initiated this program. And it really was, as I said, set up to help that specific population be able to um, access food in a way that they're able to eat it without having to you know, prepare it and process it and cook it um, for that population that has difficulty doing that. Um, it was originally set up for only elderly and disabled. And then in 1996, there was another big piece of federal legislation that was passed that opened up that program to also include homeless SNAP um, recipients uh, because they were, you know, understanding through a lot of these programs that someone who does not have access to a kitchen, does not have access to a refrigerator, have a very difficult time, you know, using their SNAP benefits. You can only buy certain things that you're just going to be able to have with you if you don't have access to a kitchen. So in 1996, that population was also included into this so the, the way that this bill would work, it would direct our Department of Social Services to implement this restaurant meals program in our state. And to do that, the Missouri Department of Social Services would first need to submit an application to the Food and Nutrition Service, which is in the USDA, that federal department that oversees the SNAP program. And within that application, the state would have to talk about um, why this is an important program, how they will implement the program, why it will really be beneficial to the SNAP recipients that would receive it. And then eventually the state would, would receive approval from the USDA. So it is a kind of a lengthy process to even get to the point to being able to implement it. You can't just one day be like, all right, we're going to start doing this. There is like a process to go about doing it. And so once a state's approved, Looking at some of the states that have already done this, most of them even start in a very small way. They don't even usually open this up to a statewide effort. A lot of the states have, who have implemented the restaurant meals program already have started in just a couple counties, right? So Illinois did it and passed it right before COVID. So the pandemic has kind of stalled some of the implementation of this, but they really started with just a few counties around the Chicago area. They didn't just do a widespread call for this. And once they do that, um, it also is a process for the restaurants that want to partake in this. So not every restaurant can do it. Not every menu item can be available. It really is a limited program 
where a restaurant who is interested in possibly being part of this program would also need to apply through D, the Department of Social Services and thus through the USDA to be a qualified restaurant. And part of that becoming a qualified restaurant, you not only have to apply, but you have to have um, uh, you know, handicap accessible entrances, you have to have a, a bit, you know, seating available for individuals, you have to have a menu item that is a low cost menu item um, that's set aside for this, for the use of this. So someone can't just walk into a restaurant and order steak or lobster or something gourmet. There are specific guidelines of what menu item can qualify for this restaurant meals program, which yet again limits um, the program. It's not just kind of a, a free for all. Um, and so if you're an individual that wants to access this program, it does happen pretty automatically if you are um, in that qualifying population. So to, to access the restaurants meals program as an individual, you do have to apply for SNAP, you have to qualify for SNAP, you have to be you know, part of that program. And through that entire SNAP application, there are questions in there that talk about, you know, your age, your disability status, um, what your living situation is. If you say, you know, I, I don't have a, um, a consistent place to stay, um, I'm living in a shelter, all of those questions are answered in the application for SNAP. So then your card will be kind of triggered as someone who can qualify for this restaurant meals program. And that's how that works. Does anyone have any specific questions about the program? Christine, have you uh -huh. received any information back um, or anyone that you know received any information back from Illinois to see how it's working? I, COVID has really stalled them. Um, I still think they are getting a lot of like the nuts and bolts really kind of going. Um, I talked with Teresa, who's now with the St. Louis area food bank. She used to be at a food bank in Illinois and they're still kind of working through the kinks of getting it all like rolled out. Um, I think they got it passed like in, you know, late 2019, early 2020. So I really think that stalled them. Um, but I know there's a lot of places in California, they just moved to a statewide model, but the, the counties that have been doing it there have been very successful. Um, and I know there's a few other states that also have done it. And are you seeing, um, does, does Representative, uh, well, I guess Senator Mosley um, have any thoughts of where it passed that she would like to see it get started or have you had a conversation with her? I have not had that conversation with her explicitly. I think the main reason that she is even just thought about sponsoring this program is I believe that she has some family members who run some restaurants in St. Louis and they're the ones that came to her that said, Hey, we really want to help out. And we heard that this is a program that could help, you know, and you know, some populations that could use that. So I think that's even how the idea started. So my guess is that she would kind of push it towards the St. Louis area. Uh, just because I think that was the impetus for her even filing this bill. But I think those conversations would happen on the Department of Social Services level, um, even more above even Senator Mosley level. But I think that was her intent in sponsoring it from the beginning. Thank you. Sure. All right, I think Nisha, you can go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of where we are um, in the bill. So as I said, it's Senate Bill 798. Um, Senator Angela Mosley um, is the sponsor of the bill. I talked a little bit about um, why she had decided to, to sponsor this bill. Um, she is a Democrat from the St. Louis area. Uh, and she had filed the bill, um, you know, right back in December when these bill filings had begun. Um, and the legislative session goes from January through May. And so we didn't hear much for the first month. And then on February 16th, as Amber was talking about the process, um, the bill was moved to the Senate Seniors, Families, Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. And on February 16th, it had a hearing in that committee and the committee hearing went rather well. There were lots of folks who had testified um, in favor of it. Uh, a lot of the senators seemed to be really interested in it and thought that it might be a really good idea. 
it passed that committee seven to one and then moved um, on to the floor of the Senate. It was brought up on the Senate floor just a few weeks ago. Uh, there was a debate on the floor. Uh, a few senators rose and talked about some concerns they had. A little bit about this program, but I think even more so the conversation was just in general about their general concern about the SNAP program um, and a lot of their concerns about that program in general and how it is done. And I think their concern about some fraud and abuse and a lot of like kind of the rhetoric that you hear when some of those safety net programs are discussed. A Senator tried to add an amendment to the bill that would really harm the SNAP program in general. And at that point, Senator Mosley decided to pull it off the floor and not move it forward and not allow that amendment to be added. And so at that point, the, the bill was moved to what they call an informal calendar, meaning they can bring it back up to the floor at any time. And since that time when that debate had happened, Senator Mosley has really been working this bill pretty hard, which is wonderful to see. So she met with quite a few of those senators that rose up during debate, kind of talking against not only her bill, but also against the SNAP program. Um, and they um, had some really great conversations. And from what we're hearing that those senators who had those concerns are going to kind of stand down and potentially not raise those concerns when it comes back up. Um, and we're hearing that this bill may get called back up to the floor pretty soon. So it really is perfect timing to do some advocacy on it. Uh, we really think that she's had some really fruitful conversations about this bill and this program specifically minus the entire SNAP program, right? Um, but really talking about this bill and what this program can really do, um, that we really think there is a good chance that of it getting a, another chance on the Senate floor and another vote and maybe passing. So um, if you wanna move to the next slide, Nashelle. Um, so as I said, it's on the Senate. So we're not at this point even gonna really talk about it on the House. So your state representatives, you are more than welcome to talk to them about this bill. But right now, our real focus is on the Senate because we really want to get a good positive vote in the Senate. I'm going to link to um, our one paper that we have of this bill that you'll be able to see a little bit more about some of my talking points that I have been talking about. Um, and you can use any of that stuff um, when you reach out to your senator. So if you do not know who your state senator is, you can go to senate.mo.gov and there is a button on there that says look up your legislators and it will have you type in your mailing address um, and then it will tell you actually who all of your um, um, the people that represent you. So all the way from senators on the federal level to your House of Representative members to your state level members. So if you want to do that, you can find out who your state senator is, and that's the most important person regarding this bill today. Um, on the, and I'm also going to put a link to this um, slideshow that you can then open up, because on my next slide, if you want to go to that, Nashelle, um, it has just a really sample email that you all can use. Um, I always recommend kind of typing your own and editing the one that I have that to make it more personal to you. Um, but this is just kind of the basic information that we want to get um, imparted to the senators who are going to be hopefully hearing this bill again really soon. Um, so that's the link to this the slideshow. And you should be able to go in and find that and you can copy and paste that email. Um, and you should be able to then open up the fact sheet as well and you can share that with those senator. Um, but as I said, it's really vital to reach out to your senators today, if possible, because the, the conversation with the Senate could happen as, as early as this afternoon when they go back in. Um, you are also more than welcome to call their office. I know, at least for me, calling is always a little more stressful to me. I'm not really a phone person. So email and texting is more my MO, but phone calls are always more important, I would say, even than email. So if you are inclined to do that, the senator's phone number and their office is listed on that um, legislator lookup on the website as well. 
you probably will not speak to the senator, right? They are super busy during legislative session. You will talk to either their chief of staff or their legislative assistant. Both of them um, are very knowledgeable about bills and about what's happening. So giving them the information and having them share the information with their senator is, is also very important and a great way to do it. Um, they will share the information with their bosses but you will most likely not speak to the senator themselves. I've had one time when I've called and the representative themselves answered the phone and I was completely thrown off and not sure what to do. So so you 99% of the time will not speak to the legislator when you call their office. Um, anyone have any specific questions about the action for today? I'm going to put one more link into the chat. And this is more about, so this bill is super important to talk about because it really is timely, right? Um, but there are always bills moving through our legislature, either trying to um, make access to SNAP more difficult, uh, making um, safety net programs more challenging to access. And a lot of folks in Jefferson City just do not think that hunger is really a thing, right? Um, so really doing some education with your legislators, talking to them about food access and nutrition access and food insecurity is super important now and moving forward. Um, a great resource to some statistics and information is the Missouri Hunger Atlas. They are a group of research, researchers out of Mizzou in Columbia, and they put these wonderful um, data set together every couple years um, and they break it down by county. They have these wonderful um, tables broken up by every county in the state of Missouri and it has all of the data that you could ever want on hunger and safety net programs and poverty and it's just a great data set for you to share with legislators or even just educate yourself on. So I put a link to that report uh, if you click on the link, it will take you directly to the list of the counties and the tables. And then you can find the county that you live and you can click on it and it will tell you the information. It's just another great resource uh, for when you're meeting with legislators. If we have a question, should we post it in the chat or just speak up? Like, I... You can speak up or you can put either one. Um, I was just going to ask real quickly if you could summarize why there's... Um, hostility like what is the hostility against snap in general like why people dislike it like i can believe the not believing there's actual hunger like that i could believe but the hostility i'm just curious why people don't like it now i have my own reasons for <laughs> knowing it's a very complicated and convoluted system but i was just curious what your perceptions were yeah i mean i think a lot of I mean, I think a lot of the general concern right now in just the legislature is, I mean, kind of government programs in general, right? Welfare programs and financial assistance programs and really just thinking government is too big that we shouldn't just be giving money out. These are our taxpayer dollars and should be going to different things. Um, that charity can do a lot of this work, right? If someone needs some assistance, they can go to their church or they can go to their food pantry and they can get the assistance they need, but they don't see that as a role of government. They really don't see our role um, as a governmental body uh, supporting individuals in that way, that they really see that as more of a charity sort of a system, um, that it should not be kind of addressed from our tax dollars. I think there's a, as a general sense of what some of the people's concerns about it would be. I don't know, if Sarah, if you have a different thought on that, um, but that's kind of my sense. No, that's helpful and it's consistent sure. with what I've, it's consistent with what I've learned and what I've seen. I was just curious if that was what was really going on. So, yeah, because I, I literally, I, I just watched a recent documentary about, I mean, and just the inadequacies of the, the, the private sector being able to meet hunger needs. So, yeah, I was right, just right. curious. Yeah. Anyone else have any other questions?
Christina, I had a question that I put in the chat. Um, I'm sorry. So, oh, that's okay. I didn't know. I anyway, I didn't want to bother you. Um, no, great. Um, so, what is the plan? So, if this if this moves forward in the Senate, what is the plan for the House? Yeah. So, once it passes the Senate, we will work with the with Senator Mosley to find a, a representative on the House side that will kind of be the handler of it and will kind of help it move through the process on the House. Um, but yet again, it will have to go through the whole process again, right? Um, it does make it a little more difficult because we are getting kind of to the last last few weeks of session. Um, but once we get it through the Senate, Senator Mosley will be very instrumental in finding someone on the House to kind of take her bill and do the same thing in the in the House. Um, and then once it's assigned to another committee, we'll do a lot of direct outreach with those committee members to kind of just moving it along in the process. Um, but the sponsor is is pretty instrumental in kind of doing a lot of that with her, and and she's she's proven this last like month or so that she is willing to do work on this. Um, so that's a good sign um, that I think helping you know knowing that she is kind of committed to moving this along that she you know will do some of those meetings once it gets passed in the Senate. Isn't there like a deadline where you can't introduce any more new bills though? I thought that there was a deadline, but maybe I'm wrong. There is a deadline for filing brand new pieces of legislation, but this bill's already been filed. So it just, it can move. I mean, it could move the last week of session, probably not going to pass if it moves the last week of session, but bills that have already been filed, which this bill has been filed, it can move back to the House and back to the Senate because it's already been started. But yes, there is a deadline and I don't know it off the top of my head for filing brand new pieces of legislation. So if the bill is filed in, in the Senate, but it wasn't filed in the House, it's still yeah. considered filed, so therefore it can yeah. move in the other. Exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and then moving towards next year, so if it does not pass this year, um, one way to help ensure maybe moving it faster is for Senator Mosley to find a state representative to file the bill in the House in December or January, right? So we can start this process in both chambers, instead of only going from the Senate to the House and back, um, if she can find a representative who's interested in this and they file it themselves in the House next year, this process can move even faster. So am I hearing correctly, like if it doesn't pass this year, it just like you have to start all over or, yeah. okay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just checking. I wanted to make sure that's what I heard. And I thought that's what I heard. Yes. So at, you know, at the end of May, when legislative session is over, all of the bills are completely dead. So they have to start the process all over again. Every bill, um, every legislative session is a brand new session. So starting on December 1 of, so say 2022, starting on December 1st, legislators can then file their bills again. And then January of 2023, this whole process will start over again. But it does make it a little easier. So, so all, a lot of these legislators will have already heard about the bill. There's already been one hearing on it. So those committee members will have already heard it. So it does start over in the process, but legislators know about it already. So it does make things a little bit easier if it's filed over and over again, um, but it does have to go through the whole process again. So, uh, Christine, yeah. what would prevent the senator that had tried to attach the amendment from doing it again when they bring it back out? Nothing. Nothing will stop. Nothing will prevent them. They are will. They can do that again. Um, I think there is something to be said for kind of respect for your other legislators. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I you never know, especially in today. Um, in the way that the Senate's been working. But usually when you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation from one senator to another and they say that they're not going to or they're going to stand down or they're not gonna offer that amendment, you can usually trust that that's how it will go. Um, so yeah, there's nothing that could prevent it. It could go the same way as it did, but um, you would hope that you know those your respect for your colleague in those one-on-one -on -one conversations would actually ring true and and go that way. You would hope. You would hope. I do, yeah, you would hope. I do know that I 
pretty sure it's the same senator from what I've seen that uh, already started a Twitter campaign against it too. So that's why I wondered what would stop him. Yeah. So besides a muzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right, if there's no other questions, I'm going to stay on for the next five or so minutes. Um, but if you have five or so minutes now, this would be the best time to you know, draft that email and send that email to your senator or pick up the phone and give them a call and ask them to um, support this bill when it comes to the floor of the Senate again. Um, we really think it could make it, you know, an impact given the timeliness of this bill being brought back up. Um, but I am more than happy to stay on if, if you, you know, give a call and you talk to someone and you want to let me know what happened, feel free to um, let me know. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Christine? Yeah. Do you think it would be, um, you guys could just send out a few pieces of this to Nicole to have her send out to that um, that she's got like 135 people on that's yeah. registered yep so like maybe um the link for them to find their um yeah. legislator the example of the email and yeah that's a great idea i'll send nicole an email right now with some of this stuff and just tell her that it's pretty timely if she wants to send it out okay thank you yeah that's a great idea 